So to begin with, let's get it straight what, what the talk is about. Uh, so like the biggest problems that I've had to solve recently has been about where do I run my software? And that's kind of, kind of the theme of this talk. I think that the, the, the conference schedule had something snarky about Kubernetes or something. And, and this is not really what I'm about today. I'm, I'm not gonna be dissing Kubernetes or Rancher or any, anything else. I think those tools are amazing. I think if you're using them, please speak up so I can learn from you. Um, but this talk is about Nomad. Uh, Nomad is a, is a tool from HashiCorp. They're the same guys that make Console and Terraform and Vault. Um, and if you are faced with some of these problems, if you have a monolith that needs breaking up, or if you have a very smart architect telling you that you, know, you, you have to have microservices, um, Nomad, Kubernetes, these things are, are options for you. Um, all right, by way of introductions, um, my name is Peter Briert. I'm a, I'm a software engineer by training. Um, a couple of years ago, I had to deal with actually releasing my own software, and then the whole operational side became a, can be much more important to me. Um, there's a couple of ways of reaching me if you want to. Um, the only things I want to highlight here really is, is my background and how I came to be doing what I'm doing at the moment. Um, and sort of one of my previous employers was Alan Gray. Um, they're one of the largest mutual fund managers in South Africa. They sit on a couple of hundred billions of US dollars worth of other people's money that they, that they manage. Um, and they taught me a couple of very valuable lessons about how, how do you deal with other people's money? Like how must your IT system look and behave in such a way that you can look after other people's money responsibly? Um, I, I used to make a joke that if Facebook goes down, no one dies, but I don't think that's true anymore. Um, <laughs> if, if your banking portal goes down, I'm sure someone will die. So, so that's kind of the state of affairs. Okay, and then after Alan Gray, um, I went to repay my debt to society, and I now work at a company called Zona. Um, this is a software startup in the financial technology space. Uh, we operate primarily in Zambia and Mozambique, uh, Zambia and Malawi. Um, and that's what we do. We help communities thrive. Last night, someone asked me, why are you doing the things you're doing? Um, and the only honest answer really I have is I want to help make my customers rich. Uh, and and they, those are the people I'm talking about. That photo was actually taken in Mozambique. As they say in Instagram, hashtag no filter. Um, so, like operating a fintech in Africa is a, is a kind of a weird combination of high tech and low tech. Uh, we have USSD as, as access channels, we have Mobi sites, we have smartphones and all kinds of things. Um, there at the bottom, I'm not sure if you can read it, is, is Zona's wildly important goals. And the thing that I want to highlight there is that we're trying to build a financial technology platform that will eventually touch a billion people. Um, so the goal is quite ambitious. Oh, one, before I go on, there's a bit.ly link at the top there. If you want, you can open this presentation, this slide deck up in your laptop, um, if you want to follow along. I'm a little bit later, I'm gonna be giving some, some configuration and whatever. I'm not gonna be discussing the config values in the presentation, but if you want to follow later, you're, you are welcome. All right, who recognizes some of these icons. These are technologies that I use. Actually, I don't, not even that I use them regularly. I, these are the ones I use just to prepare for this talk. Um, <laughs> shout out some names. Who, like, what do you recognize? Yeah, Kitlan. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, the, what I want to highlight here is that Nomad is there at the bottom. It's one of the icons of many. Uh, and, and this is important. I think the tools that we choose, we have to choose them that they fit into their environment. And this environment can be computer science speak. It can mean environment variables and other tools and integrations. But it also has to fit in with your organizational culture. It's no, it's no use bringing a tool that no one can operate. Or even worse, leaving a technology behind that no one can, can operate when you're gone. Um, so what's the problem? Like, 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 
why are we talking about, about job scheduling? Because one day a developer shows up and he's like, I've got a jar, I, I've, I've got a zip, I've got an EXE, I've got an MSI, like I need to do something with this. And um, like I identify with this cat, by the way. I, I think that's the best explanation of what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. The developers, however, they, they blame this on the business people. They, and I think this comic is useful enough that I'm gonna like, just see if I can get most of it on the screen. Um, the developers blame this on the business people, right? Is, is part of our, call it our moral mandate as software developers is that we have to affect the world. It's no, it's no good just like writing a little computer program that keeps your CPU warm, right? Is we, ultimately, we want to do stuff. Um, and the developers and the business people have their own voodoo about how they decide what needs to happen and when, but okay, that's part of the problem. If you take a step, if you take a step back though, my, my statement today is that all of computation can be abstractly seen as I need to fetch some data from the boundary of my system, I need to possibly enhance that data from a place called the state, I need to transform all of this stuff, and then the result, I need to push that back out to the boundary. Now, this diagram that I'm showing on here is an ETL diagram. I think that fits the, the, the metaphor quite nicely. But I think the same statement is also true for web services and you know, mobile apps and whatever. I think ultimately what we do, our computers are just fancy pocket calculators, right? Um, where we're in the business of transforming data and like moving it around. Um, all right. And then because, because we're computer scientists or computer engineers or DevOps engineers, um, if, you take, if, you, if you get very close to the metal, if you really look at the problem, is what you know is that to run your jar or your zip file or MSI is you need a couple of resources. Without a CPU, without a network, without some RAM, and without possibly a port, the software is not gonna run. So from an operational perspective, what you want to do is you want to make sure that, that, that the process gets to where these resources are. Um, and if you get an Amazon AWS bill, this is, this is what you pay for, is you pay for the CPU gigahertz, you pay for the megabits per second you get over the network. Um, you get, you know, you pay for the RAM that you use. This little thing here in the middle is a drawing of a Turing machine. Um, it's named after a man called Alan Turing that was made famous like a year or two ago. He starred in a movie. Um, <laughs> and so, so what he did a couple of, like maybe almost 100 years ago, is he framed the entire science, the entire scientific endeavor of computing, he framed in terms of this device called the Turing device. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or not. On the left, you've got a ticket tape, it's called history. On the right, you've got a ticket tape called future, and the machine can move the ticket tape around. And then for each of these blocks, it can store a value, one or zero, and the machine has the capability to read a value or write a value. And believe it or not, anything that JavaScript can do, this thing can do as well. Possibly, possibly slower. <laughs> um, Okay, fine, so, so now you've realized you need to give all these resources to the software, you've found a computer, a, a EC2 somewhere that you're gonna run this on. What are the other things people usually forget about? It's like, how do you configure this thing? Like, okay, fine, you need to access an S3, you need to transform some data. How, like, where's the credentials gonna come from that's gonna allow you to access those resources? Um, if, you bring me your jar at four o'clock in the evening and you go home and I deploy it tonight, seven o'clock, do you care if it doesn't come on? Must, must I phone you if it, if it doesn't work? It's like these operational concerns, like a lot of balls get dropped um, between dev and ops when you don't think about these things very carefully. Sorry, there's a lot of people in the audience here. Uh, all right, so to get back to the problem statement, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a way or a place or a mechanism to run our processes. Uh, right, seems like a very simple thing. This time though, we're gonna solve this problem using HashiCorp Nomad and 12-factor apps, which like this link is all I'm gonna say about it. Um, but there's, there's some, some very clever wisdom in the 12-factor app uh, paradigm. And then before I force you to, to use a new tool that, you know, that I like, 
let's compare it with having nothing to, 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 to make sure that we're not bluffing ourselves and just chasing technology. If you have nothing, if you hand deploy your artifacts to your production servers, and by hand deploy I mean fancy bash, right? Let's, let's not kid ourselves. Um, what, what, what I tend up, what I, what I end seeing a lot is a lot of machines sitting around doing nothing, like idling for maybe six days out of a week, and then you've got other machines that are severely under-resourced and they're constantly, you know, paging or whatever the case is. So if you hand deploy your, your artifacts, that's, that's usually what happens when you start running into scale problems. Um, and for me personally, this happened when I went, when I reached three servers. That's kind of when I started running into this problem. Um, also, the other things, if I have one EC2 or two or three EC2s and I need to run a couple of different processes on them, how must I get credentials on those machines? Must I now make an AWS IAM credential that has the super set of all of the permissions that all of the process that could potentially run in this box? Is that what I must put on there? Uh, must I do something else? Like, where's that configuration file again that specifies the connection pool? And like, you know, where's, where's the log for my, for my Tomcat? Like, what machine is that? Um, there's, there's lots of things that can go wrong in this space. All right. Um, now that I've described the problem the, the way that I see it with my operator hat on, I think it's worthwhile to recognize that, that, that this whole solution rests kind of on a balance of three forces. There's the view from the developer, there's the view from the operator, and there's also the, the view that, like, that's inherent in the problem domain. So I'm gonna have two or three slides here just highlighting what is it that's kind of clever about the space. Why do we tolerate the complexity of something like Kubernetes? And my statement is that the problem domain is actually quite complex. The first sort of computer science hard problem that you have to solve if you're gonna write a job scheduler is this thing called the, the knapsack problem. And it's essentially an optimization problem, is you have too many possibilities. Some of those possibilities are more lucrative than others, and you need to determine them based on a trade-off. Um, and if none of that makes sense, the answer is the yellow one at the bottom. Um, figuring out how to most effectively get the most value out of limited resources, that's sort of the essence of the knapsack problem. Um, and if this means anything to you, this is an NP-complete problem. Um, and, and on that note, NP-complete really just means if you want to have the best answer, you have to be prepared to wait a long time to get it. Um, okay, which is interesting for job scheduling because if you schedule a whole bunch of jobs, you usually want to see those processes come up immediately. The second kind of thing that's very related to the knapsack problem is this called the, the bin packing problem. And in this image that I'm showing up here, there's two bins. And then the things in the bins are the things that need to be packed. Now, there are many ways to arrange, to arrange the things that need to get packed, but like metaphorically, what I want you to see is that each one of those little things are a process. So you might have a process that listens to web requests, right? It needs half a gig of RAM. It needs 1,000 gigahertz of, of CPU time. It needs some network bandwidth. But you don't have one process. You have 10 or 50 or 100, and figuring out on your cluster that brings all of your resources, which process must run on which cluster machine, it's actually quite a complicated problem to solve. And if you think you're gonna do this on a Saturday afternoon using test-driven development, I'm not so sure you're gonna succeed. Or you might succeed and not realize how badly it went until you know a year later. Um, and then the last thing that's interesting about distributed software is, is this thing called consensus is quite important. The different individual machines that belong to your cluster needs to have a very consistent idea of what's going on in the environment. And how they communicate about this is a sort of a critical piece of this technology, even though I, 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 like I think you can make a strong argument this is a non-functional requirement. But, um, and then what the Nomad guys do is they use a library or an algorithm called Raft. Um, which I'm not going to explain. It's way, way beyond my capabilities. But the point that I'm trying to make here is these three, these three very hard computer science problems, they're baked into the tools that we use. Solutions for these problems exist in Kubernetes and Rancher and Nomad and everything else. Um, 
And I think it serves to highlight that the underlying problem is actually hard. Um, but for it to be a good tool, it needs to simplify that in such a way that we can still use it with confidence. Um, <coughs> now, if you get a little bit more specific about Nomad and about Nomad's specific computational model, it's very simple. It has an idea of what's going on right now. Other things happen, like somebody might come along and pull a lever, and by pull a lever I mean release a new artifact to production. Or other things could happen. Your EC2 could go down. Um, who are the babies of the 80s? Who knows what happens if you feed a gremlin after midnight? <laughs> All right. I'm happy that one didn't go completely lost. Also, my only claim to computer science fame is I managed to write that uh, lambda notation up there without screwing it up. Um, I'm, I'm very happy about that. But the point is, is you have a state function. It takes your existing state, it changes the, the changes in the desired configuration, and Nomad then calculates the new desired state, and it tries its best to match your expectations. That's kind of the, the, the essence of this workflow. Um, diving right in, if you're trying to set up your own Nomad cluster, the, the hierarchical view of the different nodes in the cluster is very simple. To begin with, there's one binary that you download in a zip file, and you put it in user bin, and you're done. Nomad installed. And it's the same binary that you use for the server node, for the worker nodes, and for the command line interface. It's just the binary. Um, in terms of the network layout itself, you have two roles. You have got a machine that runs as the master, and you've got a whole bunch of machines that runs as the worker nodes. And then the worker nodes are the ones that actually perform the jobs. And then the, the, the master node themselves are actually, like they're critical, but they don't actually do a lot. Um, this slide is very detailed. I'm not going to go into it, into it in too much detail. But what I want to highlight here is the way that we've deployed our Nomad cluster is in combination with Vault and with Console. I think the, the, the combination there is so amazing, so easy to set up, that it's almost not worth not going that step if you're going to be trying this out. Um, that's the one thing. And then also for, uh, for, for sort of failure tolerance, what you actually end up doing in production is you release three master nodes, or at least three, it can be more, and then that can tolerate some outages in your cluster. Um, so that's how that works. Um, I want to prove the point that it's not very hard to set up. I've, I've heard some rumors from friends who bragged about being able to set up a Kubernetes cluster somewhere in a cupboard once, and it only took them a weekend. It sounded like a, like a good job. Um, this is the entirety of the master node nomad configuration. Um, if you're going to use Vault integration, you need that little bit with it. And I was nice, so I included the systemd configuration file view as well. That's it. There's no secrets in there. There's no IP addresses in there. That's all you need. Um, and on the right-hand side is the equivalent for the worker nodes. <coughs> Again, I'm not going to go into what it means. My point is that it's relatively simple to set up and configure and use this tool, even in the face of the problem domain being quite, quite hard. All right. Now, the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to show you the three different ways of scheduling a job. Um, if I just dove in, I think it, it, it might be a little bit of a, like a difficult swallow. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hypothesize this minimum complete problem, and I'm going to use that as an example to go through the, the different ways. So, so what we're doing in this, in this demo problem is we are taking a text file. Imagine a large file with a lot of text, like the Bible is a good example. So we're going to take this file, split it up into lines, upload the lines to Kafka, then what we're going to do is count how many instances of each word occurs and how many instances of each letter occurs. So there's an analysis step in the middle. Um, that's the map in MapReduce. And then the third step is a step where we take all of this aggregated um, information and then persist it to a database. I was going to do a demo about this, but then I decided not to. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right. So the first kind of job that you can schedule using a Nomad system is a so-called batch job. Um, the batch terminology is actually quite old. My dad used to be a programmer in the punch card days. He understands the word batch as well. Um, 
it's a little bit difficult to characterize. The, the best definition or the best colloquial definition I can come up with is a batch job is something that starts often. Um, so typical examples of batch jobs could be you have an ETL, you need to load from your production database to your BI database, or um, you, know, you have a file drop once a week. Some bank uploads a file full of transactions, you need to process those transactions once a week. That's a batch job. Um, it begins, it starts, it does its work, and it finishes. Um, cleverly, if uh, your brand color is orange, and you give these batch job parameters, you can call them serverless architecture. I'm, I'm <laughs> now asked someone at the AWS conference recently how many computers, are, how many servers are serverless Lambda uses, and they said quite many. So. <laughs> Yeah, like even they're in on the joke. Um, so in the example, the minimum complete example that I referenced, our batch job here is a little Java app that takes a file from a URL and uploads it to a Kafka machine. And this gray block here in the middle, that is the actual Nomad job. Um, it looks a little bit scary, but if you don't mind, take it on faith. That thing is actually just fancy JSON. I'm going to scroll up a little bit so it's a little clearer. Um, so there's a concept of data centers. So you can have multiple data centers with your Nomad set up, just by the way. Important here is you specify what kind of job it is that you're scheduling. We're saying that this job has the ability to take some parameters. There's a Docker image somewhere. There's ports. There's volume mounts, um, environment variables. That's it. So if you load this thing up, it now registers this batch job, and it's now callable. And then here at the bottom, this ugly little piece of bash here is how you use the Nomad command line client to, to dispatch a job that takes a parameter. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm um, going to analyze the commentary to Khan's critique of pure reason, which I've only read digitally using this application. My eyes haven't actually, I haven't actually read that, that book yet. Um, all right, so that's a batch job. Is you you give it a parameter, it does a piece of work, and it stops. OK, let me do that a little bit. Um, there's a twist in the tail here. You can also have a cyclical batch job. That's the kind of thing that runs on a, on a cron job. Um, the file upload I mentioned earlier, the first version of that application, um, the developer hard-coded the, the, the cycle to be five minutes. So we checked every five minutes if the bank had uploaded the file that we only expected once a week. Um, <laughs> now you laugh, but it's, it's, it's interesting how, how these things fall out of the woodwork. Um, my contention is with, with good tools, it becomes easier to manage. Um, moving on, so I've dealt with batch jobs now. This is the sort of the second and the third kind of, of jobs that you can schedule on Nomad are actually mostly the same. Um, and, and they're the same in the sense that they're, they're both long-running kinds of jobs. They're jobs that wait for something to happen and then do something as a result. A good example of this is the software on your phone that makes a noise when someone phones you. That's a service. It hangs around waiting for something to happen, and then it does some work. Um, so a system job is a job that runs one instance of your of your piece of software for every worker node that you have. So this scales with your infrastructure. Um, and it's typically useful for infrastructure-related problems. So we use uh, a, a load balancer called traffic, and we connect our Amazon ELB to this traffic. And we have one traffic instance on every worker node that we have. So it's, it's kind of useful in that sense. Um, now, in terms of our of our example problem here. The, 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 the thing that this piece of software is doing is it's taking these lines, doing the individual counting and the, the, the word and letter counting, and then uploading that to a next Kafka topic. Um, and then the way that we specify that job is using this piece of HCL at the bottom here. Um, it looks mostly the same as the batch job specification. What's different about it is it has a different type. It doesn't have the nonsense about the parameters. Um, this restart block is quite interesting. It allows you to specify how often the system should inspect the service for healthiness and restart it if it's required. Um, there's another Docker image. 
uh, this thing exports an HTTP port, so there's support for that, um, mapping the ports across the, the Docker network boundary, um, command line orgs, and then you know environment variables and the service block. Um, I'm going to get back to this, so a little bit more about that. That's a system job. Um, if we ask the Nomad cluster what's the status of that job, it gives us four instances of this, of this process. Um, every process in a Nomad cluster runs in what's called an allocation, and the allocation ID is unique. Um, and then that allocation is then where the, where the rubber meets the road, if I can put it like that. That's where your jar becomes an actual process. Um, at the bottom here is the Nomad node status command that just shows that we have four worker nodes and you can kind of see that the four allocations run on each of the four worker nodes. Um, the next kind that we have is a service job, very similar to a system job. What's different about this one is you tell it how many instances of your process you want across the cluster, starting from zero because sometimes you want to disable software all the way to thousands. I don't know, uh, HashiCorp recently did a demo where they scheduled five million jobs in like five minutes. Um, we haven't had to do that yet. Um, anyway, service jobs is what runs the majority of our business code. That's our, our Kafka services and our web services are running as these things. And we typically have two of each. Um, and when you have two instances of each application, it gives you blue-green deploys, which comes out of the box with Nomad. All right. Um, I'm not going to go into the job file for this one specifically. It looks a lot like the system one. It's there for reference if you need it. Um, and then here at the bottom is what it looks like when you actually take your HCL file and you run it against the cluster. It says, this is your evaluation, this is your allocation, and then you know everything is good or everything is not so good. Because you can run out of resources quite quickly. If you have two too little RAM in your cluster, this is where you'll see it. So you're trying to run something, it requires more resources than you have, do something about it. Okay, close to the end now. There's a couple of cool things that I wanted to highlight. Um, when you integrate Nomad with console, you get the service discovery of console essentially for free. Um, which means that if you have an Nginx front end and your Nginx needs to connect to specific services downstream, like this integration is available for you. I'll highlight it here. These two values here, 31,000 and 26,000, that's actually the port numbers for the REST interfaces that these services are making available on the cluster. So now we know the IP address and the port number, so we, we've, we've discovered our service. Um, if you do your integration with Vault, again, there's, there's first-class integration support for this. And this is what we do to give access to AWS resources to our processes. So we, we provide them with valid AWS environment variables. Um, in the Nomad job template, you'll see this template stanza. And what it does is it reads a secret atomically out of Vault and then populates a text file um, in a specific format. This little marker here means that Nomad will interpret that file as a, as a list of environment variables that will then load into your process. And this way, every process in your cluster has the narrowest set of permissions that it requires, um, rather than the broadest set. Um, all right. There's interesting runtime information that's made available to, to your processes if you run them in Nomad. If you're using Kafka, there's these interesting permutations of configuration that needs to happen, where if you're a consumer, you need to be the same, you need to have the same consumer group configuration as all the other processes that are the same as you. So you can effectively parallelize all the work. However, if you're a producer, you need to be a, have a unique producer ID. Um, maybe a little bit of an edge case problem to solve, but it's interesting how Nomad makes these, these variables available that help you configure this. In this case, what I've done is I've used the the allocation ID um, to uniquely distinct, make the transactional ID distinct. Um, actually, I haven't. This is for the, the information for the system job. But um, all right. So other thing that's cool is you can use these tags in the Nomad job to program your environment. We use that for two things. The first one is the Prometheus integration. Um, Prometheus is then set up to look, at the, to look at the cluster and scrape all the services that have the Prometheus service tag on it. It will go look at their health endpoints and scrape metrics from there. Um, 
I, I think this is profoundly cool. If there's a sort of a synergy between your different tools and they, they start feeding off of each other's capabilities. Um, the other thing that we use the tags for is to connect our load balancers. Um, we have an internal uh, Amazon Elastic Load Balancer and a Zona internal namespace. And then that is where all the internal services to our environment is then load balanced and, and then this takes care of the service discovery for us. Um, and here you can see there's some, some metrics that got exported from one of our services. Um, lastly, I promised something about resource allocation. Um, Nomad keeps very careful track of what are the limits of the resources. So you can specify this service, service needs like a gig of RAM or two gigs or 16 gigs like we had recently. Um, and what it will do is it will actually terminate the service if it tries to, add, to use more RAM than what you gave it. If, you, if it tries to use more megahertz from your CPU than what it's got available, it will throttle it at that point, which is a very convenient way to manage your resource consumption on your cluster when you have an unexpected load and things like this. The, the tools that are available in this space really helps with, with that. Um, I shut down our dev environment, which usually runs on like 300 gigs of RAM, to run this little demo on it, and this is why this graph shows a severely under-provisioned, under-utilized cluster. All right, recap. Um, you need a job scheduler when the number of processes that you need to operate starts to grow. Uh, trust me on this. Um, so you can, you can get away with putting a lot of your cross-cutting cross non-functional concerns into the fabric of your architecture. That's quite feasible and quite possible. Um, and don't accept tools that, that force you to deal with their complexities in your code base. I, I don't think that's necessary. There's, the, our industry has advanced far enough that we can separate these things into layers quite appropriately. Simple, bigger than complicated, better than complex. Um, I think Nomad is quite simple. I think Kubernetes is quite complex, but I've never used it, so please forgive me. Um, yeah, I, that's what I wanted to show, is a, like there's, there's all these amazing tools around there. Um, it sucks being the only one in Cape Town using Nomad, so I'd really, <laughs> I, I'd really welcome some, some questions from you guys. If, uh, if you have any, and I'm, and I'm super happy that I'm the first one to show this, <laughs> this, this meme. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Excellent talk, thank you very much. Um, you, assuming you're running on AWS and you have Nomad and Vault integrated, I understand that you can give them IAM credentials to get to certain services, that's fine. I was wondering whether you know whether you can have the implicit authentication that say IAM roles give you if your, your server running all of these instances has say S3 permissions given to it by an instance profile. Would you, or would your container still be able to get to, for it, in this example, the bucket? Or would you always have to use explicit IAM permissions? You, you can definitely associate the role with a, with a container host. Um, I, I specifically dislike that solution. Um, because when you start out with your greenfield thing, everybody knows exactly what every piece of software needs, and then you, you start composing them. And the problem becomes is, what set of permissions do you put on the host that is wide enough to allow the software that runs on it to be useful, but not so wide that when someone breaks it, they can do naughty things with it? And this is this, it's more for that reason that I want to isolate the permissions to a specific process inside sort of the container management system than on the fabric. And this makes it easy to take the solution to another um, another resource provider, uh, like Google App Engine, for example. And, and if their assumptions are different around uh, security and permissions, this model will allow that flexibility to move. It's kind of my best answer I have for you. Hi. Um, quick question on Vault. Uh, have you 
of, uh, looked at Vault Community versus Vault em Enterprise, and which one do you use? And if you use Enterprise, the specific thing in Enterprise over Community that pushed you that direction? So I work for a company with a slightly larger than usual appetite for risk. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, we try to get by without license and support fees. So, so almost our entire technology stack is open source, including the, the parts of the hashy stack that we use. We use the community additions. I reached out to them for a possible support contract, and their support contract fee for a year would have swallowed our entire revenue. Um, so they take themselves very seriously, and so do I. I just, like, I can't afford to use their, su their support contract. Um, I can offer you this, though, that the tools themselves are fantastically simple to operate, despite doing very complex things. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have an opinion on the enterprise. I, I haven't used it. One more question? 